right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Irrational Confidence Podcast. We're talking college football, and it's a continuation of our top 25. It's the summertime. What better thing to talk about but teams 20 through 16 today? My, but most importantly, in the summer, I'm joined by my co-host, the man who's denied a job at the sunscreen factory. So what do you do? He reapplied. My co-host, Fresh. Fresh, how you doing? <laughs> Hats, that might be your worst dad joke, whatever I've ever heard in my entire life, but it fits for summertime. Um, these teams we're going to th- go through today are all about defense, whether they're really good or really bad. Defense is going to be the name of the game and really determine their success in the upcoming season. So it's going to be fun diving into them and seeing where they're at and where they can go. Yeah, it was really hard in that opening not to actually laugh like and break before I got through the punch on there. I was struggling for that one. That was a good one, though. I like that one. That was that was pretty good for reapplied. I like that. Yeah, I was exactly. wondering where you're going. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we gave you just a recap here for our going from 25 down here. If you missed our first set of teams, we did 25 to 21. That was the Pitt Panthers at 25, Mississippi State coming in at 24, South Carolina 23, the Texas Tech Red Raiders at 22, and 21 was the Wisconsin Badgers. Interesting teams. Go back and check it out. And make sure you don't miss anything this summer long. So hit that subscribe bell. Like the video. Hey, put on your notifications. Hit us up every single time on social media. Tell us whether or not you agree, disagree. And with that, guys, make sure you're visiting SpinnableSports.com. But that's all I got. I'm doing that quick plug right there. Let's jump on to why people are here, why you guys are listening to us. Our number 20 team. It is the UCLA Bruins. Fresh, what a long way we have come. I think back to like, what was it? Maybe our second or third episode. We talked about Chip Kelly possibly being fired at UCLA. And now for what, the third third straight year, they're making our top 25? Yeah, going to 2021, there was a lot of unknowns of what Chip Kelly was bringing to this program. He had been there for a couple of years at that point. Um Hadn't had the success yet. We were still waiting for it to finally bubble to the surface. And then 21, they had some success. Obviously got that beat down of LSU in the opener that year. And they sort of carried it on um, with a plethora of great running backs and uh, DTR at the helm. Um, but all the things, they're all gone this year. Uh, and this is going to be a, a really big transition is, was that the small window for, for Chip Kelly and his success at UCLA? Or are they were able to continue to layer on and build and build and build? Um, you know, you kind of look at it where they have five quarterbacks right now in the mix, and I use the mix term loosely, um, going into summer camp. Um, my bet is on the five-star recruit, Dante Moore, to take over, but you never know how they're going to run, how, who's going to be able to understand Chip Kelly's system and be able to play at the best. Um, another name to me, you know, to remember is Colin Shalee, who's a transfer coming from the MAC. Um, you know, he had success in the MAC is one thing. He was able to be that dual threat. He might be getting mixed into the in the UCLA quarterback you know conversation uh, more often than not, especially if more struggles as a freshman. But I think that's the first you know uh, item that Chip Kelly and this UCLA offense and his team need to address is getting that continuity at quarterback and figuring it out. Yeah, they they're going to miss not having DTR back there. Robinson was just an explosive player, wound up game picked by the Cleveland Browns. Another thing that they're missing is Zach Charbonnet there. But they got the Ball State transfer, Carson Steele, here. And I've been impressed when I started looking back of what he was doing over there in the MAC. Now it's time. He's transferring to UCLA after his sophomore year. And he's going to get a chance to play with the big boys. It, you talked about the, the quarterback situation there. To me, it's coming down between two people. Do they go with Ethan Garbers, who has been the quarterback there? He was the backup to DTR last year. Complete At a better completion percentage, but again, Two for two when it came to interception and touchdown ratio there. I'm a little nervous about that one. Dante Moore, though, the five-star out of um, – oh, and I had where he was out of there. But he was out of – I'm sorry, Michigan. So all the way from Michigan coming through into Southern California. Dante Moore originally seemed like he was going to the Wolverines and then he just winds up over – originally committed to Oregon and then – backs out of his commitment to Oregon if you're taking and then goes over to UCLA if you're taking a look at 24 7 right now there are three quarterbacks that are the only three that are 
100% five-star recruits in the entire country. Nico down there in Tennessee, and good luck on us trying to pronounce that last name when he eventually becomes the starter. And a guy down there in Austin, Texas, maybe you might have known of him, named Archie Manning. He's over there in Texas. Those are the only three quarterbacks that are 100% five-star. Dante Moore, I think, is going to get his opportunity there in Westwood. I think he's going to have an opportunity to play. But the really big, I think the biggest get for UCLA is J. Michael Stuvant coming in from Cal. Impressive season for the Golden Bears. 65 catches for him. Uh, he wound up with just over 750 yards, seven touchdowns. Was there probably their number one receiving target? There's a lot of moving pieces. I think that when you talk to me a little bit here, Fresh, about saying that UCLA is going to have to rely on defense, I think that you're going to have to rely on defense early in that season. That Utah game very early on is going to really be the breaking point of whether or not this UCLA offense can come together. They're looking at U- at Utah to open up Pac-12 play in week four. Well, look, I think you mentioned Carson Steele earlier. A great steal coming from Ball State, you know, and being the ninth leading rusher in the country. And of the top 10 rushers, only him and a certain amazing running back from Ole Miss are the only ones returning. So a lot of firepower there, getting a, a, a much more spread offense allows maybe him to hit the holes and, and be a more of a, a, contrib- a contributor. And that's saying something from what he did at Ball State. So interesting to see how he balances in there. And this was the fourth best offense in the country, you know, but – Young guys at positions, new guys getting continuity together. The defense, can it be worse than what it was last year? It better not be. Um, They gave up 28.3 points a game last year and 399 yards a game. And ironically, as bad as that sounds, that was actually the sixth best defense in the Pac-12. So people didn't play much defense out there. Um, They gave up 275 yards passing a game, and that was 11th in the Pac-12 and only 11 teams in the country were worse, including North Carolina and Tennessee. Their pass defense is where they got destroyed. Whether it was Washington you know, or, or whoever they are playing at the time, they were just throwing all over UCLA, and that's going to be an issue that Chip Kelly's got to understand, whether you protect your defense by running the ball a little bit, a little bit more, not scoring as fast, or maybe they were building up big leads early and they're giving up a lot of pass yards later, but stats-wise, they gave up a ton. And that's going to have to be resolved because – as you get, if you did watch the UCLA USC game, Caleb Williams and that USC offense did whatever they wanted to do. There was no way that they had any issues with UCLA. And if you want to actually take the next step and compete, they're going to have to stop somebody. Um, Oregon, Bo Nix is going to be better. If the, you know, Washington's going to be a loaded offense. You have offenses all across the conference that have improved and have better quarterback play. How are you going to stop them and get off the field? That's going to be the biggest problem, Chip Kelly, not just this year, but going forward. You can have Dante Moore. You can have whatever quarterback you want. But if you can't stop anybody at least once during a football game, you're not going to go very far and actually win for a, a play for a title, much less actually play in the college football playoff successfully. So they've got to address the defense, got to address the pass rush, the secondary, finding ways to build a more you know team-oriented, if you will, to, to make that next step. They've shown up the past two years. They've had a lot of leadership, but can they go there? They do avoid Oregon and Washington right now in the regular season, but if they get them in the Pac-12 title game, because there is no divisions anymore, obviously, that might be a, a ticker. Get them in the playoffs, maybe take them to that next level. They're going to have to stop somebody. Their four biggest games, though, are also on the road, at San Diego State, at Utah, at Oregon State, and at USC. How do they survive outside of the Rose Bowl? Obviously, any game in the Rose Bowl is basically a home game for the other team, so they should be well aware of how to deal with adverse conditions. But you're going to have to go on the road and at least win two of those four. San Diego State, I think, they have a pretty good shot at. But when you have to make a trip to Oregon State, Utah, or USC, how can you win one of those two, potentially even two of those three, and take the next step? That's the biggest thing. Um, Chip, this actually might be the biggest year for you because the expectations now are a little bit higher. The past two years, you were able to sort of build, build, build. You had the veteran quarterback. Now everyone wants to see what you did at Oregon, playing for Pac-12 titles, getting yourself in the, college, in, in the BCS. That's where they were at Oregon. They want to see that same success at UCLA, and that's where you've got to take them. Um, I think the floor for this team is 8-4, and four, and the ceiling is 11-1. and one. I think they can beat everybody on their schedule except for USC. I just don't see how they can be, take down the cross-city rival. But everybody else on the schedule, I think they have a chance of beating them. So anywhere between 8-4 and 11-1 and and is where I see the Bruins finishing the year. Yeah. 
UCLA bringing back nine starters on that defense there. Most importantly, La Tu La Tu. Uh, I've wor- been working on my Samoan Good job. Very good job. Yeah, you know, it's great when one of our, our top followers on Twitter really helps with the Samoan pronunciations and, and coaches me along on that one. But his 10 and a half sacks coming back, that's huge. He's one of the best set- pass rushers in college football, and probably because he plays on the West Coast, plays Pac-12 after dark, I don't think he gets enough respect. And maybe it's something that we need to talk about more going through this season. But 10 and a half sacks last season – 83 yards for a loss in those 10 and a half sacks. That's very, very impressive. UCLA was 3-1 and one on the road last year. I thought that was kind of when you were sitting there talking about their road schedule. Because when I was looking at their, their schedule coming up this year fresh, I jumped to the exact same conclusion that you came to. That week four game at Utah. It's never easy to go into Salt Lake City. I would have to probably go back and look, and maybe when we get to Utah and we talk about them, we need to take a look at what their home record's been to really kind of drive this point home. I think Oregon State's going to be one of the up-and-coming teams in this season. Them and Texas Tech are my two top like sleeper teams that are kind of outside that top 10. They could really make a run into getting into the top 10 and maybe making a New Year's Six Bowl game we really crashed the party. But you're right. That that game the weekend before Thanksgiving, at I mean, technically it's an away game. You're playing at the Coliseum and not at the Rose Bowl, but you're still sleeping in your own bed. So really is it technically a road, road game? Not really to me. I mean, well, like a, you know, the Rose Bowl, there's they haven't filled that place up with the majority of their own fans in decades at this point, it feels like. I mean, obviously right. you probably go back to the early 2000s, so – they should be experienced with traveling against road teams and road fans everywhere. Right. I have them. I'm, I'm looking here. I'm, I'm having a hard time. I got their floor at eight wins as well. I, I don't see them not winning eight games here. I think there's a lot of very easy winnable games on their schedule, especially you got both Arizona schools. You got Cal, you got Stanford, you got Washington state, and then a really a joke of a non-conference schedule. Coastal Carolina, I know that they their quarterback's coming back, but eh. San Diego State, I don't want to sleep on them, especially because their their stadium is called Snapdragon Stadium, which that's kind of cool to me. But North Carolina Central Eagles, I'm not worried about them in that game. I'm looking at this here. I got them eight wins. I don't have them getting past ten and two though. I, I really can't see them getting to that eleven win mark there. I got them ten and two. Very close area. Like I don't think there's a whole. You're not going to have a really bad six and six team. They're not going to have a twelve and zero team. So I got them at ten and two. That's their best possible record. Now before we jump, because obviously this is the last year of the Pac-12 schedule for them before they go to the Big Ten. Do you think that they they have to get their best? You know, they have to get at least that ten to eleven wins this season because when they get to Big Ten their struggle is going to be significant, especially in a rude, wel- rude welcome to the conference that they might not even see 10 wins for a couple of years until they get their feet under them. I need the, I feel like it's kind of the same thing we're talking. We need to talk about Oklahoma and Texas as well. I feel like they need to be nine wins. I don't say, I, don't, I won't say that you have to get at 10, but I do feel you need to be at least nine and three and be a very respectable team coming into the conference. Yeah, because I mean, you see they, they released the schedules, you know, just recently. And, you know, you look at 24 and 25, who's making the trip out there? I think Ohio State and Nebraska make the trip out to UCLA. And those are basically going to be home games for those two those two programs. So you're not having to deal with Cal or Colorado traveling to the Rose Bowl in November, October, September. You're having massive fan bases that's going to add to all the pressure of winning. Yeah, because you're looking at games. You got USC. USC is not going anywhere. Ohio State is coming out that way. Nebraska's got and, – and really, Matt Rule really turns around the program in week two – or year two, sorry. Um, you got to tra- travel to the big house. You got to travel to Iowa. You got to travel to Death Valley and play LSU. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ne- you got to win this year, really, because next year is going to be a really, really rough year for the Bruins. Yep, I agree. So, all right, let's go to our number 19 team in the country – that is the UNC Tar Heels. Man, Fresh. Depends on who you talk to on the Tar Heels. Drake May and the Tar Heels are coming off of a, 
a good year. A, I don't know if I want to call it a great year that they're coming off of here. A, I'm, I mean, I'd be pretty happy if I was a Tar Heel fan. The only thing that makes it tough for me coming into this is that that loss at the end of the season to wrap it up. I know that you're playing only in the Holiday Bowl against Oregon, losing 28-27 in that game. That was a rough back-and-forth game. That was one of those games that Oregon, you you shouldn't have lost to Oregon in that game, going back to that Holiday Bowl. The Tar Heel schedule, too, is brutal, especially in the first four weeks of the season. And it, it doesn't really get – it gets easier on the back half, but then you end the season with a really, really tough schedule. This is just their first four weeks, ladies and gentlemen. They start neutral site stadium – against South Carolina. South Carolina, we have them at 23. Uh, you play App State. App State's always going to be upset-minded there. You got Minnesota coming into town. You know, depending on what you think about Minnesota, that could be a tough game. And then you have to travel to Pittsburgh week four as well. That's a tough way to start the season for the Tar Heels. But again, Drake May, possible Heisman candidate there fresh. So Talk to me a little bit. What are you seeing with UNC? Well, I think the, you know you brought up a really like is the win total actually like good for North Carolina football? Like, are they is that actually like how do fans actually see it? like oh that's actually successful? We're winning ball games, and you kind of look the way I kind of initially looked at it was they just feel like they're just short of being that quote unquote great team. They're always like they're good, but they're they they haven't had like that great season yet. Like they, they'll get their eight wins or whatever, but that dominant win. And you kind of look back at 2020. They went eight and three, went to the Orange Bowl, which is a New Year's Six Bowl. And it felt like a 10 and one season to Carolina fans. Okay, we're going to the Orange Bowl. Then they got blown out by Texas AM, which getting blown up by AM in 2020, that says a lot about that team. 2021, you kind of thought, all right, Sam Howe's going to take this team to the next level. They're going there. Got high flying offense, but abysmal defense. Three one score losses, as well as a 23 point loss to Georgia Tech. They found up them six and seven. If they had won those one point games or even showed up against Tech, that's three, four, four more wins that are flipped the other side. That's a nine, 10 win season. How close could they have been there? And then 2022, they ended the year with four straight losses, three of which were by single digits, including that one point loss to Oregon. They were nine and one after beating Wake Forest on November 12th. Nine and one. And they couldn't win the game the rest of the year. It's just, they feel like they're, they're, a, they haven't fully broken through. And is it part of the quarterback play? Is it the defense? Is it the team in general? Is it, the, you know, where's the, that, that item that's just not kicking into the next side? Um, and you, you mentioned it earlier there with the, the toughest four-game schedule. I think they have the toughest first six games because then you add on, they have Syracuse and Miami. Now, Syracuse and Miami are world beaters, but when you look at the first six games of playing legit teams, the first six games of the year, you have no break. They've got to be ready to play because they have tripped up in the past against other teams. They've got to be able to show up. They can have their season over by the you know middle of October. That's where it falls on Drake May, which is a lot of pressure for the kid. You have no more Phil Longo. You have no more Josh Downs. So your offense, now your voice in your head, your, your signals from the side, that's changing. Your go-to receiver, that's changing. How does he mature as a quarterback and as a leader of this football team to understand I've got to be able to score. I've got to be able to smart. I don't know what this defense is going to give me. I've got to find a way to gel with my team immediately and get us cooking right off the bat. You do gain transfer wide receiver Devontae Walker. Um, that should be able to give them a nice little boost. They still have to develop the rapport. But you have also the second best offense in the ACC, second best passing attack. That's a standard you have to live up to now because the conference is – it's probably not as good as it was last year or the year before, but you still have to show up and win it. Florida State is going to be much better. Clemson's going to be good. You've got to be ready to play. You cannot blow an opportunity. You're not also going to be given a gift of potentially having two, you know, um, edges, two, two separate divisions in the conference. It's the two best records make it. So that opportunity now is going to be even tougher to get to the get to Charlotte and play for a championship. You've got to be ready to go. We looked at last year in the opener versus App State. They should have blown them out. They let App State storm back. They almost lost the game three different times. Um that's a problem right there from a top-down issue, in my opinion, of not having the team fully ready to play. And sometimes we got to look at Mac Brown as the head coach. Mac, you've done good at North Carolina in your second re- in your return stint, but the team has not shown up in games. They falter down the stretch. They falter in moments they shouldn't. And that kind of eventually, at some point, has got to reflect on you. 
Are you just the old, you know, the older coach who's come back to try to be the figurehead? Or are you actually challenging these players and challenging your coaches to be better? You have talent. You've recruited really well. But one thing you haven't done is locked down recruiting-wise in the state of North Carolina. Jordan Davis from North Carolina. He didn't go to North Carolina. There's a lot of players in North Carolina that didn't go to North Carolina that went up to other schools and become studs and they've gotten drafts and gone to the NFL. You have not locked down your own state recruiting-wise and you're getting the second-rate guys and you aren't really developing them at the full rate you should, especially on defense. You've got to be able to change that mentality and get back to North Carolina football of winning and dominating and using athletes. Where's the Julius Pepper days? Those days need to come back. Um, this is going to be a big year also for his defense corner, Gene Chizik. Gene's famous for winning at Auburn, winning a national title. He won a lot because of you know Cam Newton and everybody else, but he's really a defensive guy. What's he going to be able to do? Last year, they gave up 31 points a game, dead last in the ACC. They gave up 438 yards a game, dead last in the ACC. Only 16 teams in the country gave up more yards per game than North Carolina. They gave up 276 yards passing a game, dead last in the ACC, and 10 te- only 10 teams were worse than them in the nation. They were horrible in defense. And he was supposed to come in the year and change the defense from the year before. If they aren't improving, when does he get put on the chopping block? Um, where is this team going? Where is this organ- organizational structure? It cannot all fall on your quarterback. If you have the window right now to win, you've got to find a way to maximize it. The schedule's tough. Um, the turnover ratio last year was terrible. They were at zero. They had nine interceptions and five fumbles recovered. As a defense, you've got to force more turnovers if you're not stopping anybody. And they weren't even doing that. Um, offense, obviously, if you look at that, it's only 14 turnovers. They weren't giving up the football much. But the defense wasn't taking it away either. This team needs a holistic – there's too much talent on it. They need a holistic come down, come to whatever moment you want to call it, and figure out ways to win football games ugly if they have to. Sometimes the flashy offense – masks the team itself and it looks too pretty on the outside, but integrity of it, they're not getting the job done in the big games when it matters. And that's going to come this year. Is this team truly legit? Is Mac Brown, that coaching staff truly legit? Is Drake may truly legit. Number one, he also has draft stock on weighing on his shoulders. If he shows up, that might boost his draft stock. If he stinks, that might ruin him. He's got to be able to make it happen, um, but not put it all on his shoulders. Guys have got to step up and help him. The final three game stretch you mentioned earlier also, Duke, Clemson, and NC State. They have a, buff, a, a, a bucket end of tough and tough. How do they find ways to navigate this schedule and come out? The ceiling for them, I think, is 10-2. and two, But the floor, 7-5? and five? I mean, they could really bottom out and just struggle to get through. A lot of things can happen in this football team. It's going to come down to what's between the ears and them improving in all facets and gelling quickly. Um, they don't. They just need to be focused right off the bat, and they, they cannot have a slow start like they had last year, or they're going to be in serious trouble. And Mac Brown's legacy also might be in serious trouble. Yeah, Fresh, this team scares me because it, it can go one of two ways here. Let's say everything gels together. You know, you take a look at what what North Carolina had last year with this team, and if Elijah Green picks up, kind of, kind of adds to where he is, takes off some of the burden, or Drake May is not the rusher he was during last season there. Elijah Green had a nice season to build up on as well. And then, you know, I know you lose Josh Downs, and he's gone off to NFL, one of the better receivers. We really liked Josh Downs all last season. We thought he was highly underrated. But Bryson Nesbitt, tight end in North Carolina, he's been there with Drake May now for two years. Can that chemistry, especially in the red zone, can you put up the points to really take the pressure off of your defense there? Because for me, this defense needs to just create more pressure than what they did. 17 sacks on the season last year, that needs to increase. You take a look at them. They only had nine interceptions. They only recovered five fumbles. Um, they need something more. They need something more to be a difference maker going into this season. You want to talk about all of these things about legacy and where they're going within the ACC. This could be where we really start to have the conversation. Did the ACC pass Mac Brown by? And as college football started to pass Mac Brown by, oldest coach in college football right now, I believe. If not, he's number two with Saban. Uh, Fresh, I'm I'm nervous here. I am really, really nervous. I mean, I don't want to sell him short because I really like Drake May as a quarterback. 
I don't know what I want to say here because I want to. I want to give North Carolina the benefit of the doubt and say like this is a ten like their ceiling is ten wins, and especially if they come out because it's highly possible they could come out four and zero in those first four games. And you're right, you know, playing Syracuse and playing Miami after that as well before the you know the schedule kind of gets a little easier. It's possible, but they got to really do it early on and can't get behind the eight ball. The other thing too is. Let's say this stuff doesn't come together and the wheels fall off. This could be a six and six team. So I'm going to say my floor is six and six. I'll say ceiling 10 wins. And you know something else on top of it? You know, good teams usually compete with top 25 teams. Since 2019, so the past four years, they are four and eight for top 25 opponents. If you're not beating ranked teams, like if you're already struggling to beat some you know, mid of the road guys, but if you're not even beating the ranked teams, you're not even able to take that next step. And that's another problem where it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how they respond and, and get going in this fall. All right, Fresh, let's go to our number 17 team in the country. That is the you old mean 18. Ma- or I'm sorry, 18. Sorry. Ooh, I skipped a team here. I'm I'm looking ahead already. I have my pen on on our list here. The Ole Miss running Rebels, they are number 18, and they are led by an absolute beast of a running back, Quashad Judkins, All-American on our, our end here, 1,500 yards, 16 touchdowns on the season. This dude is absolutely ridiculous. He added in another receiving touchdown there. You take a look at Ole Miss's schedule, it's, it's not easy. Not easy being in that SEC West, but either this team is going to make a lot of noise or they're just going to be, what What do you say, a dog fart in the wind? And I, I don't know what, it, what your expression here is fresh. This could either be one of those teams that we really talked about, man, early on this is really, really going to be a good, good program, or they're just going to be, oof. That, that's rough. Well, I mean, I think first off, Judkins is all, – all I have down on my notes is stud running back because that's exactly right. what he is. And in the lane trains offense, it doesn't matter if you're the running back, the slot receiver, the quarterback, you're going to touch the football and you're going to be explosive. The biggest – you know, who is the quarterback? Are they going to run all three out there? You got Spencer Sanders come from Oklahoma State who had a pretty good career there. Walker Howard is a big-time recruit at LSU, now coming over here to Ole Miss. And you have Jackson Dark. I personally think this is a indictment on Jackson Dart. You don't bring in an experienced veteran quarterback and a five-star tra- you know, transfer recruit after one year at LSU if you're not basically saying, I need more from you. You had a good year last year, but I need more from you. What are you going to do for me, Jackson? Um, this is a, it's a big statement there from Lane. He is unorthodox, but he's all about offense and puts him in position to succeed. So watching that develop – there might be weeks where we see all three quarterbacks just rotate in here and there. Like one gets, you know, 60% of the snaps, the other one gets 40, and then the next week two other quarterbacks play. They might throw it all over the place, just being as wild and as crazy as they possibly can because in the end they need to win football games. It's not about stats at this point. I think Lane needs to actually win with Ole Miss. Receiver-wise, they should have no issues. They just got in UTSA transfer Zachary Franklin, big-time player, back-to-back 1,000-yard you know, receiving seasons there. They also brought in Trey Harris from Louisiana Tech. They also have Jordan Watkins and Dayton Wade returning. So the wide receivers, the running backs, they're going to be putting up points. They're going to put up yards. They're going to be all over the field making plays for the quarterback, whoever that might be. I think that is another big win. The other thing we've seen there at Ole Miss, they still struggle with defense. They gave it 317 yards a game last year, which was eighth in the SEC. Gave it 24 points a game, which was seventh in the SEC. 161 yards rushing game, eighth in the SEC. Their defense did force 20 turnovers, but they gave up tons of yards. So when are they going to find that athletes on defense start getting stops? When are they going to put a scheme together to start getting stops? The offense can only score so much. We saw what happened in the bowl game. Maybe they all chalked it up and they sort of, it was a walkthrough and they really didn't care, but they got thoroughly destroyed by Texas Tech. Is that the Ole Miss team we're going to see this year, or are they going to just use that one as a, a throwaway and moving forward? I'm, I'm interested to see that one because last year when you're negative one of the turnover differential, if you're not – stopping anybody you're not and you're not winning the turnover battles you're going to start losing more games than you win and that's gonna be a big problem on lane train where you put all the flash up there but eventually if you're getting paid tons of money 
you got to start looking at the rate of return. Their schedule doesn't know favors. They might have three top eight teams, a preseason top eight on their schedule with Alabama, LSU, and Georgia. That's a hefty load. They could finish nine and three and have three blowout losses or close losses to those three teams. It still could be a, a sad season. That actually might be a winning season for them. You never know. But they're 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 already stacked against them, and that means they have to show up in every other one of those football games because there's three games that they're probably not going to win, or they're going to be in major dogfights when they do get to those Saturday afternoons. The three week stretch though of Bama, LSU, Arkansas, September 23rd to October 7th will make or break this football team because you have Bama and LSU back to back weeks. We saw last year. We mentioned in the preseason. Them going to Baton Rouge, 7-0, they're probably going to be guaranteed 7-0 and go in there, and that would really be a test of what the football team happened. They walked into Baton Rouge, and they got the snot kicked out of them, and the team kind of stumbled from there um, and lost their way. This is a very similar situation. They had their tough games early, though. They might have a nice little stretch run down the back end of the season, but that first three games there in the first five weeks, they might be 2-3, and three, or they might be 3-2, and 4-1, however you want to play it out. That's how we're going to build this football team where they're at after that early stretch. If they get the snot kicked out of them, will the team just quit? Well, if they show up and play in those football games, will they actually be able to sustain and be able to bounce back and show they're actually truly worth their merit? Um, this is going to fall a lot on Lane. He's, he was given a lot of money to come to Ole Miss to make him a program. To you know, He's got, been ranked high. He got a New Year's Six Bowl game and a Sugar Bowl a couple of years ago. Now the Ole Miss fans, they want to be known for more than just the Grove. They want to actually start winning football games consistently and being a force in the SEC. Other programs can turn around pretty quick. It's up to you now. You brought in the recruits. You've complained about NIL money. You've got your collective going. Where do you show up? Um, this is going to be – this might be his entire career. We've talked about legacy with Mac Brown. This might be his legacy as well. If he's just a good offensive coach and should go back being an OC for somebody else, or can he actually be a head coach? and organize a program and be consistent with it. He didn't do it at USC. He didn't do it at Tennessee. He had success at FAU for a couple of years where expectations were low. But can he be a head coach? Can he think on both sides of the ball? Can he get everyone to play on the same page? Because there's, you can get talent to go to Ole Miss. You can get talent to go to Mississippi State. You can get talent to go to Arkansas. Can these programs actually start winning? And that's going to come down to him as the head coach. Can you organize the effort and move them forward? He hasn't beaten Nick Saban either. That's another thing. He was brought there to – He's the former offensive coordinator, Nick. Can he beat Nick Saban? He hasn't done it. Could this year be the year? On paper, it kind of looks like Alabama might be on a down, you know, down year. We don't really know if we can get the quarterback spot. They've lost a lot of talent. Can you take it, your team and go and beat Alabama or beat LSU or beat Georgia? One of those would be huge for the program. If you win multiple of those three, you are in great shape and you actually are truly ascending. Ole Miss has never been at the SEC title game, by the way. That would be a huge accomplishment if they can ever make it to Atlanta. I think the ceiling for this football team, I mentioned earlier, nine and three. Those three games against the top eight teams can be pretty tough, going to require a full team effort. But this team could bottom out and be six and six. Um, it's going to require a full team effort. Arkansas, Auburn, AM, and, and Mississippi State are must wins, in my opinion. If you lose one of any of those four games, this team is done because you already have basically three losses on your schedule. You've got to find a way to win every single one of those other games that are winnable. And I use quote unquote air quote winnable football games. Um, you went two and two against them last year and it cost you. You've got to go four and zero against those teams this year to have any kind of chance of really being successful and moving forward and, and supplanting a consistent program there in Oxford. Yeah. Fresh. This is oof. offensively. They're exciting. Like there's so many weapons over there on the offensive end, especially with Franklin now on board over there with for old miss ear. And Judkins is just a monster, man. Like, it, this team reminds me of older Wisconsin teams a little bit, only without the defense. This is going to be a power run team, I think, to start off the year and then kind of learn to throw the ball around as the as the year goes on here. But I need to see something, especially out of the back half of the secondary there. You know, Finley, um, Finley is gone there for them, but you take a look at uh, Prince is back. And Young is back out there in that secondary. I think Finley was the one that was gone. Yeah, Finley's gone uh, as I'm checking my notes here. But you take a look at this. You're talking to me, Tulane, going to throw the ball around. Alabama, going to throw the ball around. They're going to, but they're also going to pound it down your throat. LSU with Daniels, they're going to throw the ball around. Arkansas took them to the woodshed last year 
and gash them all over the place, you're going to need some payback for that. Going into Auburn, Hugh Freeze is going to be looking for that marquee win this year. Going into Georgia, this could by the time November 11th rolls around and that game against the Bulldogs rolls into town, into Athens, this team could be a shell of its former self. This could be this team could be a absolute joke and it could be only about Judkins and Lane Kiffin wishing the rumors were true that he was taking the Auburn job and not staying there at Old Miss. I don't know here, Fresh. Offensive if I'm grading this team offensively, I think they're good enough to pull off one of the upsets between Alabama, LSU, and Georgia. I think offensively, they have the firepower to do that. Defensively, I'm worried that they're not going to stop anybody. I really am worried about that they're not going to stop anyone. I'm going to say this, Fresh. I'm having, they're going to be my Auburn team this year. I'm saying this team misses a bowl game. I'm saying their floor is, I'm going to go five wins. This team could really bottom out and lose some inexcusable games. You know, you got, ULM, Vanderbilt, Georgia Tech, Tulane, and Mercer. There's your five wins, and it's reasonable that you would lose everything else there. So this this could get scary for them. I'm hoping Ole Miss doesn't get that that bad to them. I could say like if offensively this team clicks, and nine wins. I go five and five to nine win stretch there. So. I mean, it's amazing how the past three teams we've all mentioned are literally mirror image of each other. Right. Offensive. I mean, to quote Billy Bob from Varsity Blues, they're on offense, they're tans. On defense, <laughs> they're zeros. I hope people tan. I hope people get that <laughs> reference somewhere. If not, tan. guys, that. It's tan. 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 If you guys, guys, if you have not gone and seen the movie Barcel- Varsity Blues, I watched it like, couple, like a month or two back ago. It was – uh, on late at night, still when I sleep. It, it's funny. It, it hasn't aged the best, but it's it's still pretty funny. It's pretty Pre- funny. Pretty good movie. All right, let's go to now. We're going to hit the number seventeen team, and that is the Clemson Tigers, still coached by Dabo Sweeney. Guys, if you haven't listened to the podcast, you guys know how I feel about Dabo. Uh, DJ Ungale. Now we can finally say his name right. He's gone. Transfer. Bye bye. Cade Klubinek is the starter now, and we'll see what how, how things go for him because he played in that bowl game and did not look very good and looked a little, little rough. Will Shipley is back for them. Uh, really, really good running back. But, and you take a look at Jeremiah Trotter Jr., one of the best defenders in the country. But this – what what's up with Clemson, man? Like – I'm, I'm, I don't want to take too much joy. I don't want to take too much of a victory lap and be like, you know, I'll, I'll hurt myself if I pat myself on the back so far. But Clemson is is falling like a Tom Petty song right now. They're, wow, they're, that, was, that was really good. Yeah. They're, they're, free falling all day long. They are. They're in a, a massive free fall because you take a look at what they've gone through. They're, they're no longer – I mean, really, would you say that they're a college football – playoff contender well i think the record gets in there but who they play and how they are is a completely different story um they're a shell of what they were in the in, in early on and under trevor lawrence and deshaun watson they are a shell of that program no fear i think fear is probably the best way to put it nobody fears clemson anymore teams actually you know out they had beat alabama they had shown their proof they had actually beaten some good florida state teams at times they had beaten a, a highly ranked notre dame team people actually feared clemson for a little bit of there Nobody fears Clemson anymore. And you kind of, the real, the real reason, it was perfect. The last three games of the season right now, last year, show it. You hosted South Carolina, a team that was coming off a massive win over Tennessee. Maybe kind of thought, all right, they're going to be so hyped over that win. It's still South Carolina. When they come back down, we'll get them. They walked into your house and they beat you. You lost at home. When you still actually technically had life to get into the college football playoff because the way the, the fourth team situation was a mess, they could have snuck in and you lost to South Carolina. You go to the ACC title game, you blow out North Carolina, whatever, and then you get your bowl game. 
you have your new quarterback. We're going to put in Cade Klubnik. We're going to run out there with everybody. Breezy played. All, all the guys played. Well, they, they, were, they were dressed for the football game because Tennessee beat the trash out of them. Um, what did I say to the program where two teams that are very close whooped your tail in the last two, 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 two of the last three games of the year? That shows that right there, Dabo has – the guys aren't showing up. The talent level across the board isn't there, and nobody fears them anymore when you're getting thrown around like they were in the last few games of the season. Since 2019, they're 10-6 and six versus top 25 teams. All right, you know, that's four years. That's winning some football games. They have nine total losses since 2019, but six of them are the past two years. These past two years, 20, uh, 21 and 22, they're getting beat around. And people are starting to beat them up, beat up on Clemson. They're starting to survive games. They survived Syracuse last year. There's still controversy on that one itself. This team is not who they used to be. And now you're running Kate Klubman got there. He's supposed to be this five-star stud. Didn't look very good during the season. Looked terrible in the bowl game. How is he going to be able to survive with – I'm not going to say it right now. They don't have the offensive weapons around them either that really scare me. Will Shipley in two years has been a guy. He has not been the superstar that everyone played in Matt the Bay. going to come out there and go for, you know, be a, a Christian McCaffrey type. He hasn't done that. He couldn't stay on the field his freshman year. He was bigged up here and there. Last year, he, did, he was okay. He was, he was a guy. But he's not the superstar that I'm talking about. Like, all right, you know, that's first team all ACC. That's second team all American, hands down. He's not helping him. They don't have the receivers that are, you know, the Samuel Watkins of the world aren't showing up and, and playing for these guys. Um, they don't have the Clemson receivers that scare you anymore. Like this offense is not who it was. And that's the thing on Dabo. Who are you actually recruiting? How are you developing these players? These guys are showing up and they're actually regressing. or not even seeing the field. That's a problem. Defense is still strong. Recruiting is still strong because this week they had a couple more five, oh, this t- time period around the year, they had a couple more five-star players commit to them. Um, they're still getting the elite guys, but what's happening once they're showing up on campus now? Are they actually developing these players? Because they're, they're getting a top 10 class every year, but they're not showing up and playing at the elite national level they should. You mentioned Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Also has Barrett Carter. I think the two of them are this year are going to be studs. Um, but what can they do? Because the defense is theirs now. Miles Murphy's gone. Breezy's gone. How do they embrace the role of their leaders of the defense? What do they mold that defense like? Do they take charge and become leaders and push them to be a little bit better? Do they hold the rest of the team accountable? Are they the true team captains? Do they go to Kate Klubin and say, hey, this is our team. We're in charge. That's what Clemson needs. They need somebody to get in that locker room and actually be a vocal leader, challenge the rest of them. Look, you're, if you're being a four-star, five-star player, for the majority, you're going to have some talent. You can be able to play. And at some point, if the coaches are holding you back, you as players got to hold yourself accountable. There's Miami teams back in the day that the coaches didn't even have to be there. The players would go out there and they coach themselves, they police themselves, and they would go out and win football games. The great programs, the USC has done the same thing. And you, know, you hear the stories where the players hold each other accountable. At some point, Clemson's players got to hold themselves accountable because Dabo, you've let your team down. You might have that you know, nice smile. You talk to the parents. You have all the facilities to get the recruits. But you guys haven't shown me that you're Clemson football lately. This comes down to the players. Which one of you guys hold each other accountable? How do you show up on game day? Your schedule, you're going to get a rude awakening this year. Last year, you had a lot of turnovers on offense. You had 22 turnovers. You cannot be – that's not sustainable. And that goes back to holding each other accountable, of protecting the football, not throwing interceptions. What are you doing to help your team win a football game? The schedule. You could be 3-0 and when Florida State arrives. And this is not just a Florida State team. This is a very good Florida State team that we think would come in with a lot of firepower and really challenge you in Death Valley. This is going to be a big-time football game. I got a feeling it's going to be an 8 o'clock kickoff on ESPN or ABC or whatever. The place is going to be rocking. It's great during kickoff. Like we talk about Lane Stadium, opening kickoff, and everyone's there, you know, jumping around, getting fired up, and touch the rock, run down the hill, whatever. Will the crowd be in the football game in the second half when you need them most? Or are you guys actually going to keep your team there? That's what you want. You want the big games there at Clemson. You need to start showing up on paper and on the field at the same time. At Syracuse, Wake Forest, at Miami, they look easy, but you struggled in some of those situations where you had to go overtime to beat Wake. You had you know, Syracuse last year, you struggled. You can't let these games, those games that are winnable escape you because the elite level of you supposed to be there and playing Florida State, you might get two matchups with them this year. You've got to show up and be ready because playoff spots before they expand are still very, very limited. And if you want to show your back – You've got to win every single football game and prove you're there. Four of the last five is really where this team is going to be tested. How can you, healthy can you be coming down the stretch at NC State, Notre Dame, Georgia Tech, North Carolina, at South Carolina? 
How do you finish this season and build momentum into a potential ACC title game, into a potential college football playoff spot? Where is this football program going? That falls on Dabo. That falls on the team holding each other accountable. And that shows actually being feared. Are you going to be feared in November? And can you actually live up to the billing? I think the ceiling for this football team is 11-1. and one. Obviously, it's ACC. And there's, we've mentioned North Carolina. They're beatable, et cetera, et cetera. The floor is 7-5. and five Because Kate Klubnik and that offense, I don't know what we're going to get from them. That offense might actually hold this team back. And more turnovers like last year would result in more losses. Um, ACC will find ways to beat them with Notre Dame on the schedule, with Florida State on the schedule. They could be 11 and 1, they could be 7 and 5, but can this team hold each other accountable is really going to be the difference maker in where they're going to be sitting at the end of the year. Fresh, there's a couple before I go on what I don't like about Clemson here. You know, Shipley's got 26 touchdowns in his two years playing there. He is a solid running back over a thousand yard season, but then he only had five games last year where he crossed the hundred yard mark. You take a look at sophomore Antonio Williams. He is looking like the next really good Clemson wide receiver. It's going to come down to him and Klubinek creating that connection between the two of them. Bo Collins is the other name that everyone's going to talk about coming in for Clemson this season. Uh, that six, three sophomore, is he going to be the, you know, the red zone target where I can throw a, a back corner fade and he jumps up and goes, gets the football for me. It, you're going to need all these guys to take away the questions. It's going to take away the what ifs. What if this guy, you know, and the thing that scares me with Clemson is offensively with their weapons. And I still think their defense is going to be pretty solid all season long. It's a good, it's a really, really good defense, even with the talent that they lost. This offense can't sustain an injury. You can't sustain an injury to Klubinek. You can't sustain an injury to Shipley. You can't sustain an injury to Bo Collins or Antonio Williams. You have to stay, just like you're saying, how healthy are you at the end of the season? Clemson has to stay healthy this season. They're not going to have a shot at any of this. We're going to know how good this Clemson team is very early on week four when Florida State comes into town. And then you take a look, though. Even if you win that game, what's the one place that Clemson always struggles to play at? Syracuse. Syracuse. And they go the next week to Syracuse to play in the Dome. Folks, I'm telling you right now, for some reason or another, Clemson always struggles with Syracuse. It's kind of goofy, but it is what it is. Well, note on that: the last ten years, six games have been decided by single digits in that right in that matchup. That's and that's going to be huge for them. I I think you're going to be able to easily take apart Wake Forest and Miami. We'll see about N- NC State, but Notre Dame's going to be. Taking a look at Notre Dame, they're going to be looking, if especially if they lose to Ohio State early in the season, they're going to look for that marquee win to kind of vault them back into the playoff conversation. And, and they could get that very easily by coming down into South Carolina and win over them. If, if this offense doesn't stay healthy here fresh, I don't know. I, I, I'm with you. I still see seven uh, a pathway to seven wins for them because – the ACC is the ACC, and it's not a a murderer's row of schedule here. You know, I think they got. I think they'll take out Duke, Charleston, Southern Florida Atlantic, Wake Forest, Miami, Georgia Tech. There's six right there, and you just got to win one more. Um, I have their their floor at seven, and I'll say their ceiling is eleven. I think they either slip up against Florida State, Notre Dame, or South Carolina along the way. I mean, and from a road standpoint, their their hardest trip is the last game of the year to, to uh, down to down to South Carolina in yeah. Williams Bryce Stadium. Um, I don't really think Carter Finley. I mean, at night it might be a little bit different, but Carter Finley is not as intimidating. So their road trips aren't hard. Uh, this is going to be, you know, it's there for them if they play up their potential. If not, then they are truly they're just a mediocre program. Yeah, and and we have officially seen the downfall of of Clemson, and and they're hanging there, of being like, "Are you still an elite level program, or are you now at the point where, yeah, you're really good, but you're not elite." Yep. 
So, all right, Fresh, we're to number 16, and it's the Kansas State Wildcats. People forget this is the Big 12 champion. Will Howard's back, only team to give TCU a loss during the regular season last year. I No, not during the Big 12 title game. Well, yeah, and that's still regular season to me, I'm going to say. But Deuce Vaughn's gone. Will Howard's back. Talk to me a little bit. How do you see K-State going? Well, I think I'll start off with I really – I appreciate the flex that the marketing department for Kansas State has done. Um, recently, I was driving a uh, buddy and his family are moving back to Florida from, from Colorado. We had to drive through Kansas, and we drove right through Manhattan, had stuff all over the place. So let me get to Lawrence, Kansas. When you enter Lawrence, Kansas, there's two Kansas State billboards there talking about how they are. If you're a real fan or a real person from Kansas, you're a Kansas State fan, how to get the license plate, whatever. And on the way out of Lawrence, Kansas, there's a big billboard showing who the Big 12 is football champions are there was nothing in manhattan from lawrence but from from the kansas university uh but everything in lawrence was all about k-state so i give a major flex there major props for putting up your billboards on the highway right there and just give it a little you know a little nudge to your eight-state rivalry but like you said this is the defending big 12 champions i mean this is a quite an accomplishment there coach Kleiman has done phenomenal stuff when he was at um north dakota state he's carrying that on now you build develop players you grow them through the program, and then you have them succeed and they play hard. They play for each other offensively, defensively, whatever. Um, you take guys who are three stars like Deuce Fawn was, and you make him a superstar. It's all about playing for each other. There's You're not going to have the five-star players all going to Kansas or Kansas State or Iowa State. You know These smaller programs in the Midwest, they're not going to get that kind of – you've got to develop the players, and he's done a great job there so far. They were plus 12 in the turnover margin last year. That's a real big reason why this team was successful. They were very opportunistic. They made things happen. You're plus 12 in the turnover margin. Offense had six interceptions and six fumbles lost. That means you controlled the football. You did not give it up, and you were very smart with it. And the defense had 16 picks and eight fumbles recovered. It means they were very getting after it, forcing stuff, being very active. They might give up some yards, but they're not preventing score. They're, they're not allowing scores, and they're getting the ball back and setting up, you know, field position. That's how football teams win. You got to find ways, and they were doing it. Now, can that same exact offensive, not turning the ball over, defensive forcing turnovers at a high rate, continue this year? That might be the big push. Will this team be the same where they're at now? Will they get better, or will they kind of regress a little bit because you're forcing all those turnovers? You really do change field position, change scoring opportunities, and stem some tides that teams might be on a run or trying to form a comeback. So that's something to keep an eye on as we move forward this fall. Will Howard, he came in and really took over the middle of the season after you know Adrian Martinez got dinged up and they were kind of in and out early, and then he took the full role toward the end of the year. The 15 touchdown passes, four picks, and of those four interceptions, two were versus Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. So 15 and two. Think about that for a second. Um, can he really? He infused all, uh, energy into the offense. Can he build off of himself and get better? And can he continue that energy in the offense for a full season this year? That's going to be another thing right there. After being through the tutelage now of climbing, getting the guys to build around it, having that confidence of last year's season of being a champion and playing Alabama in the in the, in the Sugar Bowl, how will they be able to defend and build off of it going forward? Um, middle of the league, though, in total yards per game, but second most rushing yards per game with 208. They're going to be a ground and pound. Use the play action. Build off of that. Don't put your quarterback in bad situations. Do you want it? Obviously, stay, by running the football successfully, you stay out of third and longs. You stay out of position where you're going to be sacked. Bad opportunities for a quarterback. You keep yourselves in manageable down and distant situations. That's what this team is built about. If they had they had success at North Dakota State, this entire coaching staff, they brought that same thing to Kansas State, and you're starting to see it development now. Short yardage, being smart, managing down a distance, and the scoring points, long drives, saving your defense. That's the offensive philosophy that they bring at K-State. They can find a guy who like like Deuce Fawn to fill in. There's been many years. Darren Sproles is obviously a K-State guy. They find running backs who are small. I'm going to use the term diminutive and put them in situations to be successful, catching the ball in the backfield and running it. Can they find that next you know, next running back or running backs and put a group together to keep carrying this you know offense forward? That's another good thing right there to see. Um, scored 32 points a game. So in the Big 12, that's actually six. That's just really they score tons of points in the Big 12. Can they maintain that 30 points a game? Because I got to know Oklahoma is going to continue to keep scoring. 
Texas is going to be better. Texas Tech is going to be better. You're going to have to find ways to keep track and keep up and keep pacing some of these football games you're playing in the league if you want to continue to keep winning and building off of last season. The defense, they were the best defense in the Big 12 in points allowed with 20 points a game. It means they were getting up off the field. They were forcing stops. They were forcing field goals as opposed to touchdowns, and they were winning football games that way. They were third in yards allowed with 365, second in pass yards allowed with 216, and they had the second most sacks with 28. That's a lot of a, a lot of great defensive efforts. They've lost some guys up that, that squad. A couple of corners went got drafted. Obviously, a big defensive lineman got drafted. Where are they going to find those guys to fill in the gaps and replace them and get that production back? That's another item. Was it a one-year wonder for Kansas State? They all sort of built up and played hard, or will they have the layers of depth to continue to carry this forward? That's going to fall on this coaching staff, but it's also going to fall on the players in the weight room to get better and develop as the season went on from – Fall uh, from spring practice last, you know, this past the spring through summer football into fall camp into the first couple of games of the season. Uh, they don't get Oklahoma, they don't get Cincinnati, they don't get West Virginia, or BYU. So they, three of the new teams they get uh, two of the new teams they get to miss. Their bye week is September 30th. They could be four and zero heading into that. Uh, Mizzou and, and UCF are night nice, are nice opportunities in that first four games where. We don't know what we're going to get from UCF. Don't know what we're going to get from Mizzou. You could have two big wins, or you could be two and two. I think they'll be four now at that point. Um, you also get Troy, so they're at a conference schedule, not too shabby. They're actually putting together some decent, you know, decent layers of games there. They're not getting some walkovers that some other programs might have, especially early in the year. The eight game stretch, though, that's really going to define this football team, and really we're going to know if this team's a one year wonder or not, is the run through the conference. Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, TCU, Houston, Texas, Baylor, Kansas, Iowa State. Um, they, they, nobody caught them last year. They didn't, weren't ready for them. They snuck up on a lot of people and were able to surprise people and take them out. Can they do the same this year? That's a gauntlet of a of schedule right there down the stretch. Um, I think ceiling is 10-2, and two, the floor 7-5 and five, um, for this football team. So where can they find ways to – continue to replicate last year or will they fall back and become a seven and five middle of the pack team? Um, it really falls on the offense and finding the ways to replicate that all you know, the running game production they had last year. Fresh <clears throat> in six games last year, when Will Howard took over as the starting quarterback last six games that they played in, in the 2022 season, four out of those six games, he completed less than 60% of his passes. I don't like that. He's got to improve upon that quite a bit. On the back side of it, though, they only lost one game in that stretch, and that was to Alabama, who was motivated to win that game. So I don't – listen, I, I never would have expected Kansas State, even as the Big 12 champion, to go in there and beat up an, a, a ticked-off Alabama team like they did last year. Uh, Will Howard was 13-3, and touchdown the interception ratio during that time. So he's got to improve the completion percentage, but, you know – The talent's definitely there. He's a good quarterback. He needs to – DJ Gittens, good running back there. He was the spellback for Deuce Vaughn. The thing I need to see Gittens do, we know he's going to be a tough runner, but is he going to be able to catch the ball out of the backfield the same way Deuce Vaughn was? Deuce Vaughn was your fourth lean receiver last season. You bring back Phillip Brooks. You bring back Sanat, uh, the tight end right there. And, yes, there's Sanati or something like that. I don't know. I'm, I always am notorious for messing up names here, so I apologize if his family is listening. But K-State, they, they definitely have to make sure that they kind of build on that. They have an easy stretch. You talked about those first four games. UCF's the only challenge there. And, again, I think Oklahoma State's going to take a step back this season, maybe a pretty big step back where they're not going to be very good. Really the first marquee game that we're looking at is that Texas Tech game week – seven right now that's when we're going to know what how is this the k-state that has a chance to be repeat big 12 title champs or is this a k-state that is a nice team in the big 12 they're always going to be there yeah they're you're not going to be able to overlook them but they're they're not going to mess around and really compete for the big 12 title every each year in and out i need to see a little bit more they've lost quite a bit on the defensive end side there. I need to see Mott and Duke both pick it up a little bit. I need to see them get closer to that 7-8 sack mark this season. They'll definitely have the opportunities available. 
Um, but again, fresh when I'm looking at this team, like I said, first five games, I can easily see them winning that. I also got another win versus Houston. I got another one, Baylor, Kansas. So I, I got them at their floor at nine wins. I mean, I think it's really going to come down to the two Texas games, Texas Tech and the Texas Longhorns. And depending on how those games go, I, I'll throw in TCU just for giggles there. But realistically, if you're not, if you don't got Texas in the name, I don't really think that you got much of a chance of beating being Kansas State this season. So I'm going to say I'll, I'll give them a ceiling of 11 wins. I think that one of I I'm really high on Texas Tech this season, so I'm going to say Texas Tech or Texas clips them. But I got their their floor at nine and their ceiling at eleven, so this is going to be a pretty darn good team. And, and folks, if you're new to the party um, and you really don't know much of the history about K State, go back to the, the mid '90s under Bill Snyder yeah. into the early 2000s. They again, just like they are, kind of has the same kind of feeling where you're like, oh, it's a one year thing. You know, it's it's not that much. But then year after year after year, K State was there. They were beating Oklahoma, every, you know, in big upsets here and there. They were taking care of business. They were playing for Big Twelve titles. Um, they were legit program, and they were a legit national, con- you know, power. I'm not saying they'll be a national power right now, but they will be competitive at a high level um, under Coach Kleiman and the way that they built this program. They're doing it the exact same way through walk-ons, through JUCOs, through developing players. Um, guys you've never heard of stepping up on Saturday afternoons in the purple and silver and getting it done. Yeah, I remember this is the team that just two years ago took, put the boots to the LSU Tigers in the Texas Bowl. I mean, again, LSU wasn't the team they are today, but they, they, they can compete. They can compete. This is not a bad football team, and I think they're perfectly slotted at number 16 right now. I think that's a perfect yeah, spot I mean, for them. And as we saw last year, the Big 12 is very competitive. Yeah. Um, and all those games were down to the wire, back and forth. And it's uh, it's finding ways to win football games late and having the, the mental fortitude um, to come through in the fourth quarter. Yeah, absolutely. They're fresh. I think that this is going to be an interesting season, especially in the Big 12 and especially for the K-State Wildcats. We'll see, though. We'll see. Who knows? It could be a fun That's year. That's why we're here. That's why we play the games. Yeah, absolutely. All right, folks, that is our 20 through 16 in our preseason top 25. Hey, you know what's coming next? It's teams 15 through 11. There are some shockers in there. There are some ones that Fresh and I really, really disagreed upon. And there's one that I think should be maybe even top 10 material. Well, top 10 material by the end of the season, at least in my eyes, but... We'll get to them when when we get to them. So make sure you're subscribing to wherever you get your podcast from. Leave us that five-star review because you guys know Fresh and I, we're those five-star prospects. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. Get notified every single time we have a new episode drop. You're not going to want to miss it. Folks, we got a lot of great stuff coming your way. Special thanks to our producer, Drew. Without him, none of this is possible. Follow us on Twitter. Interact with us. Engage. We're on the march to 25,000 Twitter followers. Yes, 25,000 Twitter followers. Hey, it's fun. We interact with you guys. Hi. That's all I got, Fresh. And all you Twitter followers, become subscribers on the YouTube channel as well as the podcast. We'd appreciate that as well. That's true. Just join the party in all facets. Yeah. Um, with that, another great run through teams. Remember, everybody, go watch Varsity Blues. And uh, we'll talk to you all later. Ten. Bye, y'all.